her, one isn't convinced at all that she's the kind of student who would know what awaits her in college. And so, sensing her innocence, one I feel a bit of apprehension and concern for her. But when that feeling passes, the utter magnificence of the moment imposes itself. For a while, that rudimentary schoolhouse where she has been prepared for the wider world receives. We recognize that that is where her intelligence and ambition found a place and took hold, inspiring her to intend to accomplish. And knowing that such a simple schoolhouse can arouse such aspirations, one is overcome with the logic that excellence in education can do so much more. This girl I see is my doppelganger, and I hang this painting in my office to remind me constantly of the children who, like me, awoke to possibilities because of a school, because of a classroom, because of a caring teacher. So when I retired from my position as president of Brown University, frankly, I imagined a life of leisure, contemplating the joys of my decades of leadership in higher education. Because you see, I left home here in Houston at the age of 17. And I had not lived in Houston since that age. So the chance to reacquaint myself with the city and my family was compelling me to settle in this city. As I returned, I was immediately drawn to the places of my youth, and these visits rekindled the memories of the extraordinary experiences I had as a girl. My gratitude for my teachers has grown even stronger as a result. Perhaps it is so because of the recognition of where I started and how greatly that contrasted with where I ended up. Perhaps it's a recognition that the odds of my achieving success were so low, and yet a team of Houston school teachers and leaders purposefully overturned those odds. It's quite amazing to me, too. I don't know how many of you go to Fifth Ward, how many of you know the depth of despair that existed then, even from those days. Certainly, you must be aware of the deep um, segregation that existed at the time, and the fact that we were, though in the shadow of these kinds of magnificent buildings, we were absolutely prevented from venturing beyond Fifth War. It was a different world. Returning there and recalling all of this and where this country was at the time is staggering to me. And I wish my students today could understand it because they would have far more hope about the future if they understood it. But literally, it was not possible to go into restaurants. It was not possible to go into certain department stores. It was not possible to go to restrooms. That's the world I grew up in, a world of impossibilities. The things that I could not do, the things I dared not do. That was my life. And so imagine, what it would be like as a child to try to think of something beyond that. Well, of course, I couldn't have done that. Wouldn't have been possible for me because all I knew was segregated Houston. All I knew were the people around me in that neighborhood. Everyone I knew was a laborer or a maid doing day's work. So were my parents. So imagine these teachers putting in my head that I could actually go to college and aspire to a career of my choosing. This was, at the time, a radical idea. 
Now, most educators can never know the myriad and decisive influences they have had on their students. They hear far too infrequently about the leading roles they play in apocryphal coming of age stories that former students relate to their own children. You probably do that. You tell your children about the miraculous teacher who inspired you. But most teachers never hear about the transformation that took place in children as a consequence of what they said, of what they did, and so on. They're not often not aware of the ways in which so many students that they've had over the years measure the value of their accomplishments in reference to the wisdom imparted to them by their teachers. Changing lives, saving psyches, setting moral and ethical examples, inspiring lifelong learning, these are the gifts that educators routinely and heroically give to their students. My own journey, fueled by the high standards that my teachers set for me, has taken me through a career in higher education where I've applied many of the lessons from my teacher mentors in Houston. They set before me standards of achievement that fueled my journey from Dillard to Harvard, from the Saltillo Institute in Mexico to the University of Lyon in France. For the first 15 years of my life in a segregated environment, I learned easily and was amply rewarded for achieving consistently high grades. But I always emphasized to my students that it was not until I faced severe academic challenges that I started on the path to leadership. And I'll tell you the reason that I say this. Frequently, <coughs> at every university where I've been, Students come in to me and they say, Ruth, I really want to change my course because this teacher has given me a C. Um, and I really don't think they understand me. I don't think I'm going to get a good grade in the course. And I really want to change and drop, I want to drop the course. And then I tell them the story of what I experienced as a student. The moments when I learned at a deeper level because a teacher told me my work was not good enough. I tell people in the workplace the same thing. A lot of people talk about their supervisors. They don't like the evaluation they're getting. They don't like the fact that they're being told they could do something better. I tell the story of my time in Princeton. Oh, Mark, start I had a wonderful boss. His name was Aaron Lemonick. Uh, he was a great man. He was dean of the faculty at Princeton. And I once did some work for him. I took it to him. And he said, this is the worst work I have ever seen by anybody. <laughs> by anybody. And to punctuate his disgust with the quality of my work, he kicked the file cabinet so that I understood how really disgusted he was. And I did what any sensible person would do in regard to that. And that is I went back to my office, I put my head on my desk, and I cried. And then I got up and redid the work. This very man who criticized me so harshly is responsible for my becoming a college president. So our students today need to understand that it is the challenge that elevates us, not the approbation, the ceaseless approbation that we long for as human beings. That's okay from your partner in life. It is not okay from your teachers. They should be demanding. So I always say to my students, if your faculty are not demanding, get up and register for a course where you can find a demanding faculty member because you're not getting good education if they're not. So I had this experience where I tried to drop a class when I was at Wellesley 
because it was just too difficult, yes. as you heard. And I went to the teacher, and I said, I don't understand anything going on in this class. I'm missing the assignments because everything's in French, and so I want to drop the course. He refused to allow me to drop it. He said succinctly, just work harder. I railed against him. It was clear to me that he didn't care, not, not one whit, whether or not I learned in his class. What a deeply insensitive person. Just work harder. But I just started working harder. <laughs> and it was not until one day I'm sitting in class. How many of you studied French? Probably most of you. So one day I'm sitting in class. And all of a sudden I realize, oh my God, I understand what's going on. That was the epiphany of my education. That if I just worked harder, things would come. And it was not until then that I learned that I could overcome challenging intellectual problems. Thanks to a rigorous environment, I thrived, committing myself to giving my best in all circumstances. And that's what you all want for Yes Prep students. So I applaud the efforts of Yes Prep to challenge students to achieve in a rigorous environment. Nothing is more enabling than the moment when a student learns how to solve a seemingly insurmountable academic challenge. Now, if you think it's tough dealing with students who don't want to hear that message about academic challenges, imagine what it's like, for, forgive me for this, because I know some of you are in this room, think of dealing with parents who don't want those kinds of challenges for their students. So, you know, we deal with lots of helicopter parents in colleges who feel that that challenge that their son or daughter is encountering is really not appropriate for them. But yes, PrEP is doing the right thing by emphasizing that. The lesson of how to accomplish remains with them for the rest of their lives. Working at the top of one's ability, making one's experience with prefix, mining one's experience with previous challenges, incorporating lessons of failure to achieve success. I relied on all these things to push forward in every leadership assignment I've had. Now, when I left Houston and got my education, I was perfectly content to have an office job. My mother, I remember thinking of my mother ironing clothes um, one after another. And my father as a janitor. And I thought, wow, it would be something if I could have an office job, uh, they would be very proud of that. Uh, it never would have occurred to me that I would be the person to break the barrier in the Ivy League. I was never preparing for that. I was never anticipating it. And yet, this is what our students have to look forward to. They cannot know the opportunities that they will face in their future. It's impossible to know that. So if my students say, Ruth, what should I do? I always say, you just keep working as hard as you can because the thing is to be ready. And that's what my teachers gave me. They got me ready. They didn't think there would be a future in which I could do what I've done. But failing the knowledge of what the future held, they just prepared me, just in case the world got better. Today, my students often express surprise at various aspects of my journey. How did I go from the fifth ward, they ask, to the Ivy League? And how did I, did I manage to become president of Brown? It all seems improbable to them. Yet all of us who believe in the transformation that can occur by virtue of education should understand that such occurrences are far from novel. 
What I have done is not extraordinary. It is what one expects, given the power of education. Over the span of history, innumerable individuals, communities, and nations have been impacted by the force and influence of education. The human brain, when exposed to the proper stimuli, is the greatest of all computers. It sees connections. It formulates insights. It recalls inputs. It works overtime. Such is the capacity of this organ that has enabled humankind to benefit over time from the advantage of higher order intellection. The human brain has kept faith with us throughout history, enabling advances that we could not even dream. So today, our students, your students, have the opportunity to carry these advantages even farther than anything we've seen in the past. To do so, they need the support of courageous and far-sighted leaders who understand well the power of education to facilitate discovery and innovation, personal transformation, and individual enlightenment, problem solving, and societal equity. Yes, PrEP demonstrated its ability to bring this change to students, to communities they serve, and to the world. As we look to the future, what could be more compelling than supporting efforts to make excellence in education available to the widest swath of youth? Yes, PrEP is doing that, and I applaud the stellar history of this organization and all that it brings to our city. So I signed up for an interim position at Prairie View a year ago. That was to last a few months. When I stepped on that campus and I saw these young people striving, I could not turn away because they deserve nothing but the best that we can offer them. And I'm sure you all agree, because you're here, that yes, perhaps students deserve the same. Thank you so much.